Hey, welcome to the Northeast Hunt and Film Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Alex. Here you'll find hunting stories and strategies based mainly out of the Northeast, but we'll also include hunts from all around the country. If you can hunt it and you can film it, chances are we're going to talk about it on here. Enjoy. All right, everybody, welcome back. Another episode of Northeast Hunt and Film. It is Thanksgiving week. I'm recording this Sunday, the 21st. I just got out of the woods. Yesterday, did a all-day sit um, on a community scrape that had, I run a cell camera on it, and it had does in it and some bucks. Um, Tuesday through Friday, and I did an all day sit Saturday and saw nothing but a bobcat. Their lack of presence could have been due to me being there, but uh, who knows. Today, went and explored some new country, took the rifle for a walk, uh, did some still hunting, some scouting, um, kind of looking for different spots to go when the snow flies, which I was on snow actually uh, last weekend. We got some snow in uh, higher elevations in Vermont, up in the Green Mountain National Forest, and uh, I had one buck track going that was pretty decent, and he kind of walked out of the snow line, so I drove up a little further up the road into some higher country and did a big loop and uh, just saw some does and fawn tracks. I also got out for a day uh, to film Timmy. Timmy Bolduck from Big Woods Bucks. We made that film a couple years ago, uh, 11, 15, 19. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it on the Big Woods Bucks YouTube channel. We were trying to get out and get into some snow and maybe make it happen again on 11, 15, 21. It wasn't really snow where he wanted to be. Um, we got out, we poked around, went up one mountain and cut a small buck track, but that was about it. And he took me around, showed me some, showed me some cool stuff, some big signposts and a lot of good deer sign that would be a hell of a spot to pick a track up in if, um, we get the snow, but it was one of those giant, you know, stereotypical main signposts on a brown ash, just, you know, power pole sized tree. It was raked up fresh shavings on the ground. I'm joined again this week by uh, Tucker Westney, talking all about tracking. He's been up in Jackman the last week. Uh, he got into, I guess he got into a big one. Um, got some shots off, but never connected with him. But he knows where there's a good one located anyways. So, so it's Thanksgiving week. Um, hopefully... You guys enjoy Thanksgiving Day with your friends and family. Or if you are like me and still don't have a deer yet this year, you'll probably be hunting all day. And I'll make sure and bring a turkey sandwich or two. I guess I'm thankful for, to be able to even go do this. You know, some people are not able to get out and hunt anymore. Um, so I'm thankful that my legs still work and I'm able to chase these things around even though I'm evidently not very good at it, but that's all right. Keep grinding away, and you never know. Everything can change in a second, so happy Thanksgiving, everybody, and uh, so if you do, if you are getting out Thanksgiving Day, instead of enjoying a nice meal, make sure you thank your uh, significant other or your family for letting you, letting you go out and chase some whitetails. Speaking of a uh, significant other, I want to plug, um, my girlfriend's a, uh, pretty badass photographer and, um, she's kind of just getting going with her website and stuff. She's got some prints for sale on there and, uh, I'll put a link in the description below. It's amulheronphoto.com. Yeah, she's done a couple weddings. She's, uh, pretty much down to... You know, maybe you get shot a big buck and you want to get some good photos of it. Um, if you're in the 
southern New Hampshire, Vermont, north central Mass area, um, maybe even further. Uh, reach out to her on on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Send her an email on her website. Something uh, she'd be willing to to do some photos, family photos, engagement photos, you name it, she'll do it. So really, really reasonable rates. Um, shout out to her. And um, I'm going to quit rambling and we'll get in this podcast with Tucker. Good luck, everybody. And uh, see you in a couple weeks. All right, we're back. Another episode of the Northeast Hunt and Film Podcast. Joined again today with uh, Mr. Tucker Wesney. How are you, Jason? We're going to talk some tracking today. Yeah, whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, we're uh, we're still in September now, but I think year-round our minds are in the yeah, always in tracking, snowy big for woods. For sure. But um, it'll be here before we know it. Yeah, it will. Hopefully. It'll be soon. Wearing a flannel today. It's getting chilly out, so. Yeah, this has been nice. Done with 104 degrees. Oh, big change. It was so hot all summer, <clears throat> seemed like, but. Hot, rainy, and humid. Oh, yeah. Mosquitoes. Oh, yeah. They haven't gone away yet, but. No. As much as I say I'm going to do all my scouting preseason, which I do, or postseason, in the spring, I always end up out in the bugs. Yep. Because you got to get out those cameras last minute and switch oh, yeah. others. And I know it's miserable. We hung cameras like August 1st over in New Hampshire, and it was so buggy. It yeah. just sucks. Miserable. Horse flies will carry you away. Oh, yeah. They will. So what do you What do you got for for a rifle? Uh, I got a 7600 carbine, yep. not six. With a Williams peep on it. I had a 2x7 scope on it for a little while. I took that off and... I ran that one year, I think. And it's nice. It works fine. I actually never shot a deer with it. I missed one with it. and I don't know. I wanted to try out the peep, and I really like the peep now. Yeah. See, yeah. I was skeptical before that there would be places where I – because the first deer I shot in Maine, I had a scope, and I'm damn glad I had it. I wouldn't have shot it with a peep. I don't think it was like a 150-yard shot across the cut. So I always had that in my mind that I – I was going to be screwed if I didn't have a scope, but now that I've tried the peep, I'm pretty confident that I'll be fine. Yeah. I actually switched mine up. I also got a 7600, and it came with the peep on it. Yep. And I tried it for a year. I liked how it carried, and I could shoot decent with it, but I just didn't like how close I had, even though I had a low comb stock like they should with a peep. I didn't like how long it took me to like acquire a target through it. Yep. And uh, I just, I had scopes on all my other rifles, and <clears throat> yeah, I just switched back, yeah. switched back to the scope, and I got the same one on my 7600 as my muzzle loader, you know, so it's, I feel like if you're looking through different scopes and yeah, yeah, different powers, you can kind of, for sure. but it's a loophole, um, one and a half to four, yeah. and when it's down on that low power, it's you know, I, I can shoot it with both eyes open. and That's how the 2x7 was. I had that particular scope on a couple different guns. and It's a nice scope. You leave it on 2.5, and 3. And yeah. It's just like you're looking out of your own eye, just a little clearer. Yep. But I found, like like I said in Maine that first year, that was a really long shot. But then another year when I shot the big one up there, it's if I had a scope, I wouldn't have killed that deer. Just so close. Yep. So I don't know. Damned if you do, damned if yeah, you don't. Yeah, take your chances, I guess. Yeah. Whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, pretty much. You know, you hear Hal talk about it all the time. It's just... Oh, yeah. If you shoot good with a sniper scope, bring your sniper scope. That's right. You yeah. shoot better with a peep, yeah. bring the peep. You nope. don't have to fit the part to nope. kill the deer. You don't have to do what everybody else does either. You no, just exactly. figure out your own path. Yep. Um, other than, like, the wool clothing and... Rubber boots, those are kind of... Yeah, yeah, those are necessary. Those are, those yeah, are needed. Yes, you can get away without it. People do it, but... Yeah. I don't care how expensive your Sitka gear is. It's it's not It's not wool. Work. It's not going to work. No, it's not. not going to work out for you. Actually, it might be the demise of you if you get oh, stranded yeah. somewhere. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, look at all the... You know, they didn't have synthetic fabrics back in the day. What they wear, wool. Yeah, they did know. just fine with it. Yep. 
they're they did fine. We're around now. Yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, I shoot the 180 grain core locks like most people, I guess, do with the Ot six carbines, and never had a problem with those. You can find only them. problem is not getting them. Yeah, it's crazy. I actually really good at being last minute. Last year, I bought. Well, I didn't buy. I went like the week before the season to get some shells. I was out, and that was when I realized how real the pandemic was. You couldn't get any. core locks or anything, for that matter. My brother had like five left, or five spares. I I stole some from him. I don't even remember what kind of hot six bullets I got, but that was in the back of my mind all rifle season that my gun was going to jam on me. It wasn't going to shoot like I thought it should. Right. That sucked, but yeah, I stocked up on that those thirty five Waylands. I got yeah, I got over three hundred rounds now. Holy shit! Um, the and I kind of I'm going to contradict myself here, but I believe that's part of the problem is you yeah, know, yeah, people buying exactly everything. But I did it because that's such an oddball gun. Yeah, I'm worried that with Remington being the way they are, like they're just not going to make a 35 Wayland anymore. And then why, right. why would you make ammo? Exactly. You know, eventually down the line, I should sell it right now where it's worth stupid money, but I know it's I one know. of those. It's crazy. It's the limited edition big woods bucks one. Oh yeah. I think Timmy sold his for like 3,600 bucks yeah. or something. That's worth a lot of money. But, um, I don't know. I'm going to hang on to it. I guess yeah. I'm an idiot. I may thinking maybe it would no, be worth it, more. And you never know, but are you really ever going to sell it though? That's the thing. Like I don't know. I get comfortable with it, and I start killing deer with it. it I might not. Do you got the? You still got the O ring in yours? No, I took that out. See, mine. Well, Mark Woodman took mine out, but I was trying to figure out why the pump rattled so bad. Yeah. Um. And he he he's like, it's just a it's a new Remington. Yeah. He's like, they're just not made. It's they're not, not a 760. You no, know? so my, it's mine I bought in like 2016 or 17, and it's an awesome gun. I love it. My brother has, my grandfather gave me, or gave my brother an older 7600, like a, from the mid-90s, I'd say. That gun is night and day different. Mm-hmm. It's quality. The same exact gun, but the quality is amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. a cool gun. Right now, mine, because that O-ring rotted, Yeah. because they didn't lubricate it, evidently. They didn't yeah. feel the need to. And it rotted and broke, and uh, mine's just a rattle trap. Really? It rattles when you walk. Yeah. And it, so I took the the pump off, and this is probably more or less my fault because I did get the gun wet a lot, but um, the tube where the pump, you know, fits yep. in, that was all rust, I complete rust, and not just surface rust, like pitted yep. rust, bad, yep. so... I sanded it all down. I got to re-blue it, but I'm going to put the O-ring back in. Yeah. I bought some offline for like 10 bucks. Yeah. And uh, hope that fixes it. And if it doesn't, anybody want number 86, yeah. Big Woods Bucks? Four grand today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Five grand cash. There you go. I'll deliver it. Yeah. Wherever you are. Those are pretty cool guns. I wanted them when, he, when they came out with them, but. Yeah, I got I got lucky. At the time, I thought, Jesus, I don't want to spend that much money, but. Timmy talked me into it. Really should have. Like, because I shot that buck in the white mountains in 2019 yeah and i had a 30 30 and he was 40 between 40 and 50 yards quartering to me not hard just yeah. he he had no idea he was there somebody else was actually tracking him and jumped him yeah and he ran in front of me and it was like second to last day and i was like yep bye bye yeah he was uh 142 pound five pointer yeah that's pretty good for the last day but uh hit him in the shoulder i put it on the shoulder pulled the trigger um 170 grain core locks and he stopped i thought he would just drop in his tracks yeah but he ran off and he stopped and he he had a bunch of junk in front of him i didn't shoot again and he blew at me no kidding. And then continued running, and I was like, huh. <laughs> okay. So get a hold of Timmy. He comes meet me. We go to the first bed and uh, jumped him out of it. There's a bunch of blood in it. Long story short, I chased that deer for two days, caught up to him trying to cross the river, shot him, and the bullet hit the shoulder bone and deflected. Really? 
came out of his skin and then into his lower belly. Really? Yep. And I have I have multiple people who witnessed this. Yep. We could clearly see what happened. Yep. So he would have died, but it would have been by coyotes. Yeah, yeah, forever. Um but yeah, I, I haven't I haven't even shot that thirty thirty since. Yeah. Um that scared the hell out of me. I'm, I'll never I know that's that I know that caliber like that. that caliber's killed a lot of deer over the years and but I just Yeah. I can't it, it has, I can't have that. I like to have something that you can really kinda of shoot a deer wherever. Yeah. If I had done that with that Whalen, he'd have just dropped in his tracks. Oh, yeah, that thing's a cannon. Sure. It is. Yeah, Two. we I've got one in there that she uses actually, but Yeah. It's a cannon. It's a nice gun. Yeah. But you think about thirty five caliber lead going as fast as an OT six, yeah. that's it's big. Good luck to deer. But yeah, I bought that as a. Uh, it's synthetic. I, I like the wood guns. Ooh, I bet that kicks. It, it does. And is she laughing at you? Yeah, she's laughing. <laughs> yep, that thing kicks. Yeah, it kicks wicked good. But it was a special carbine run that they made. It was only like seven hundred fifty bucks. It's like, yeah, I'll buy it. Yeah. I want to put some wood on it, but get around to it. Yeah, we need woodmen to design wood for seventy six hundreds. He could do it easy enough. Yeah, I'm sure they will. At They're just point, so behind. Think, yeah. Which is good. I got to imagine, you know, being tied in with Big Woods Bucks. and Yeah, I don't know. It'd be cool. Yeah. Somebody's got to make one. Somebody's maybe they'll make a pump gun, too. You know, somebody's got to make a pump gun if Remington's he, not going to get back into it. Remington's back. Um, I think they're focusing on, like, the 870s now. Yeah. But he he's talked about it. Has he? Yeah. He's talked about um, making pumps and bolt actions and... I mean, he could probably make a bolt action that'll, sh- you know. Yeah, yeah. Some of those like two thousand yard, whatever, stupid shots that yep. people make. He even talked about bows. Really? No but kidding. He's got to get a little more established, I think. Yeah. But. I think he's pretty well grabbed hold of the muzzleloader market in the Northeast at the moment. Oh yeah, yeah. That's. It, you you don't have to clean it. It's. That's know, like the that's number one selling point yeah. right there. Oh, for me, that's sold. As long as you use Blackhorn yeah. and um, that primer, if you can find it. Again, that's another thing that's hard to find is both those things. But yeah, yeah, they got a gun that, like an experiment one, they've tried to blow it up. They've tried to, you know, put it like 120 grains of smokeless in it and cover it with blankets and put a string on the trigger trying to get it to explode. They can't get it to blow up. Really? Yeah. So, but that gun's been shot like 400 something times. Yeah. And, uh, you look up through the barrel and it looks like it's been shot once. The dogs are barking again, huh? I have to cut that one out too. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, that's cool. That's, you shot a Thompson Center with some, anything for 400 shots. It's not going to do good. You couldn't even load it. No. You have a hard time loading it after five or six shots. Yeah. I was, when I was a kid, I remember being, I was part of this deer drive, and one of the older gentlemen shot at a deer, and he'd shot like five times. It was most older season, and I remember them telling a story that the last time he shot, the bullet just came out kind of slowly and landed right in front of him. They watched they watched it come out and land like <laughs> 10 feet in front of him. I'll never try, I never figured out if that was actually a true story or not, but I believe it probably was. Yeah. They get so gumped up. And, I had a similar issue with uh, the muzzleloader I had. It was a uh, CVA, I think. Yeah. Trophy taker, hunter downer, whatever the model yeah, yeah. was. It's just yeah. like a cheap 50 cal. And I used the pellets because that's what all my buddies used and yeah. whatever. I didn't know about Blackhorn and all that. But uh, I hunted throughout New Hampshire's muzzleloader season. And between being cold in the truck and then bringing it into the house, I never unloaded the I left it loaded. I just yeah, take yeah. the primer out. Yep. And uh, the last day I'm walking out and it's after legal time. I'm like, oh, I'm going to unload it. And how you unload a muzzleloader is yeah, you, you shoot, shoot it. it. Yeah. So I pulled up, aimed at a tree, and it sounded like a cap gun. And I remember the bullet the bullet coming out and you could see it spiraling. Yeah. And it was just blue, like, it looked like a firework. <laughs> and you could hear it hit the tree. And then roll like it out, I, Like I threw it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, what in the hell? And I didn't know what it was. And so years later, I met Mark Woodman, and he's like, that that uh, 
Pyrodex absorbs moisture. Yeah. He's like, so just condensation, you know. Yeah, it got wet. It, it, it's not it got anymore. wet, and I'm like, well, what if, you know, what if a big buck had... Yeah, you would have thrown it at him, too. Yeah. Yeah. It had just hit him, and he'd gone, ow, what it, the <laughs> hell was that? And then ran off. Oh, yeah. But, so, ever since then... Yeah, I've, I've always used the Pyrodex pellets, too, until recently. I started using that Blackhorn last year. It's way better. Yeah, I, I just started using it honestly because of listening to the podcast and whatnot. Yep. It seems nice. Yeah. It took me a minute to get used to the, the pellet form of it, dumping it, measuring it. But right. Got it all measured out and should be good to go. Yeah, anybody, any gun, doesn't matter. It should, Blackhorn is the way to go. Yeah, yeah. It's clean. Yeah, those pellets are a nightmare. They're convenient. They are convenient. That's the biggest thing. But they yeah, are you got nasty. that little felt pipe cleaner thing. You yep. put it in, drop them in, yep. done. But it's not worth it. No. But um. Yeah. So what? Uh, let's switch gears. Uh, so we went over your gun. What do you? Uh, you your typical eighteen inch lacrosse boots and woolies? Oh and, yeah, yeah. Yep. I am just right out of the book, probably. Yeah. Some people would probably say, but yeah, green wool pants, and I I wear the uh, silent predator. It's the, like the light camo with the orange cape on it. Yeah. Wear that for a jacket and yeah, the lacrosse burly boots and yeah, your typical attire. I just wear I wear a fanny pack I bought up north one year when I was up there hunting and I wear that under my coat actually. I learned that from reading the How Blood books, but I never did it before and he's 100 percent right. You get all that snow down behind yep. that and it just turns so nice. it's all wet. And, Yep. So I wear my coat over that, and it works great. Yep. I just carry a GPS with me as a radio, actually, more or less, because me and my brother both have those uh, the Garmin Rhino yep. radio GPSs. So we use those. I actually don't really use that as a GPS anymore. I just use my Onyx. Yeah. I download all the areas I'm going to hunt up there previous or before I go up there. and That works awesome. I like that Onyx a lot. So That's a game changer. It is. Then I usually just carry a bottle of water and a couple snacks, rope, something to start a fire. Yep. That's not, the thing about much. the thing about tracking, man, is you, you you can go so light. Oh yeah. yeah you don't you need can. a lot of clothes. No, you, you can know. get away with a lot. I remember one year I didn't even I forgot to pack water that morning. I usually bring two water bottles. I didn't bring any, and I had some goldfish. So I I ate my goldfish out of my Ziploc, and then I drank out of the stream with that Ziploc. Is a little fishy, but. It worked. So you Pun don't intended. Yeah, exactly. So you don't you don't need anything, really. You can just bring a strap to drag your deer out, you're good to go. Yep. Yep. Don't Some, get lost. A couple ways to start a fire, compass. Yep. Cause as convenient as Onyx is, man, it, it's still an app. It's an electronic. Yeah, exactly. And if you use an iPhone then it's even it's even worse. Less reliable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm still running an iPhone six, so Oh Jesus. Yeah, I just yeah. got a new one. A couple of weeks ago, I had the iPhone 8, I think, for like three years. I got a new one, and now I'm probably screwed. This one probably scrapped out on me. My other one was fine. It just, it's getting old. Yep. Mine, I don't know why. I bought it I bought it used off eBay. Yep. Like four years ago, and it still holds battery charge all day and still works pretty well. Some apps don't like it, but. Yeah. Like, I. I fly my drone with it. I, yep. you know, it still works. So perfect. I got my money's worth out of that, but I feel like some of the updates, I don't like, it won't even update to the new, it what's it like 13? Yeah, I think so. Mine it's won't, mine won't update out of the 12s. Really? Yeah. I think it's, yeah, someday it just won't turn on probably. Yeah. <laughs> I should probably <laughs> That's get, what get back my, on eBay. I had an iPhone 6 too. That happened. Yeah. After a few years, just didn't turn on anymore. <laughs> Well, they've designed them that way. Oh, yeah. I know. Just like cars. You got to get a new one every few years. Bastards. Yep. But, yep. yeah, so I guess you could. I'm kind of a minimalist Yep. when it comes to being in the big woods. I don't take much with me and like don't, really, don't really need to. Like Lee Libby. Yeah, pretty much. He says that he's like, I take, I take my skills in a dragon rope. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I take else? a ratchet strap for that. It just works pretty good. Just the just nylon strap. piece? Yeah, just the strap part That's of it. That's not a bad idea. No, I've had good luck with that. I got a, 
uh, nylon rope. Uh, it's like a 300 pound rating or whatever, but yeah, yeah. I, I figure I ain't ever gonna shoot anything that big. So I, I figure with the uh, ratchet strap part of it, the strap part of it with the hook, if I got in trouble, I I don't know, hook might come in handy for something. So or if you screw up on a big buck, want to hang yourself? You yeah, can... exactly. <laughs> hook it on a branch. <laughs> Yep. So, um, what about, um, when you're on one and, cause I know this varies for, for people. Um, some people leave the track, some people stay on it and slow down, but when you go get into the sign where he's feeding around and you think he's going to bed down, you just creep yeah, crawling at that point. Or? I'm definitely still learning that, but I don't leave the track and I am creep crawling at that point. I'm definitely death creeping, going really slow. Yep. But I don't ever leave the track. I just always feel like if I leave it, then I'm going to waste too much time trying to come find him if I don't succeed at swinging on him or something. So right. I've tried I've tried leaving the track one time, and it screwed me all up. It didn't work out. So Not that it couldn't work. It just Yeah. I don't think it's ever going to work for me. Maybe. But as of right now, I don't leave the track. Yeah. The only thing, I haven't done it yet because I just I can't stand not knowing what's going on. Well, that's just it. I like to know everything. But Hal talks about um, certain situations where, like, if a if a buck heads up on a little a little knob, yeah, and he thinks he's gonna bed there, he'll circle the knob all the way back to his tracks, and if he hasn't come out, he goes 180 degrees back around and comes up on the knob, yeah, because the buck's gonna be looking at his back track, and he shot him in their beds looking the other way. Yeah, yeah. I've always on the lookout for that because that me that too because be... I've heard him say that on different podcasts and that makes a hundred percent sense. Yep, it really does. I just I, I don't. I've probably been presented with that situation and not capitalized on it, but as far as I know, I haven't. It's probably hard to recognize. Well, yeah. that's just it. That's what I mean. I'm probably it's probably happened to me. I just haven't noticed it. I'm sure in his situation, it's happened in woods he's hunted in ever since he moved to Jackman. So yeah, exactly. he's like, I know that hill. I know how big it is. You yeah. know. But he's just a, he's he's an animal. Yeah, he 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 knows what he's doing. I remember one day because we hunt up there too, same area areas. I I don't really know where he hunts, but right we everywhere. Going, yeah, exactly. We were going out this one particular road up there, and it was like freezing rain. It's all dirt roads, obviously. The road was horrible. And me and my brother, my brother was behind me, and I was in front of him. He called me on the radio. He's like, "Hey, you might want to pull over soon. There's this truck right on my ass." And I I was going down this hill to this log land i was like yeah i see him when i get down here i'll pull over i pulled over a towel in his ram charger yeah and he passed us with he must have been doing 40 miles an hour on that icy road yep i i tried to keep up for a good minute but there was no chance i don't no. know how, i'm heard, sure he's going that fast to get rid of people like me that are going to try to keep up for a second but no he just that's just how he drives that's how, i don't yep. know it's crazy Yep, and then he then he mounts the deer on the hood of the Ram Charger. Yeah, and he can't, can't, see, can't see anything. <laughs> He's all over the road. I know. No, it's pretty cool. I like hunting up there. I've never run into to him in the woods or anything. I've just seen him on the road driving around. It's cool to know he shot all of his deer right there. And yeah, roughly. Yeah, his house is pretty impressive. Yeah, they go all the way up into the. It's like a timber frame house, and they go all the way up into the That's eaves cool. and just slobs yeah but someday that's what i'm working towards yeah but he lives long ways to go he lives in it you know oh i know those storms those midweek storms that you know you can't get to he can he's out and you know oh yeah not to take away from his skill set he's still no absolutely. i hope to be i hope to be half as good as he is someday but um, no it's definitely hard but if you can if you can do that all deer season then right law of averages Yep. 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 We and we have the luxury of learning from people like him. Yeah, the podcasts you know. are a great thing. Any format that we can listen to, it's. Yeah, yeah. You seem to pick up something from every single one. Yeah, you, you know. Do. Everybody's got a different opinion, so. And they all work because there's no. There's definitely a better way of doing it, but there's no real right or wrong way. No, there's there's like, kind of guidelines. Yeah. You know, like the feeding thing, like, you know, if they're wandering around feeding, they're about to bed they're down. They're definitely going to bed down. Yeah, you know they're going to. I've had some that haven't really bedded down. They just kind of slow up, eat a little bit, and then keep moving on. But eventually they bed down. And it seems like that's happened to me during the, like, I go to Maine 
now, like the third week. So it seems like right. they're they're pretty well peaked right, right around then. So they're just yeah, up there, yeah. They're headed, but once they get with a doe, it totally changes things. So yeah, the uh, Northeast Kingdom last year, muzzleloader season last weekend of the year, I got on track and followed it all day long, and it was at the end of the day it had been feeding a lot and it was just it just it would feed and feed and feed and then i'd slow way down and it wouldn't bed down and then it'd take off on a straight line again so finally i was i figured i was wasting too much time and it's it'd been going straight line for like a mile so i just headed i was i wasn't running but i was fast walking i had to make up sometimes like three in the afternoon it's a long ways from the truck i just crossed another road so i'm going 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 all of a sudden 150 yards in front of me through the wide open maples this deer jumps up out of his bed he just straight line right to his bed sat down for like the last like i said mile previous before that he showed no signs of laying down he just i don't know he was on a mission got tired i guess and laid down yeah for a minute but i didn't get a shot at him he was he was i had open sights with my muzzle loader and i could see the horns but it's just so far away Happened yeah quick and lob one out there yeah, I almost did. I actually had I had the hammer back with my finger, like half squeezed on the trigger, and I remember telling myself, "Don't shoot. Just that's stupid if you even try." Because he was dead run away from me. It would have been a Texas hard shot if anything. So I didn't try. I was hoping I ran up after he went out of sight. I was hoping he did the same thing you just explained that he would right. run off and slow down. He didn't slow down because I, I was like the third time I jumped him that day. So yeah. good one. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was all right. Maybe. 160 180 but he didn't have much for horns and i knew that yeah. first thing in the morning because he went through some real tight spots and some trees and but i almost like, ah, it's late whatever yeah well that's just it i almost left him then but I, it was me and another buddy he was uh, hunting up there with me but he was hunting somewhere else and we left here we left my house at like three that morning and just headed up to the kingdom and figure for shits and giggles we'd try it and sure enough i stumbled on that track and so i didn't I figured it'd be a waste of a day if I left that one and right. tried to find another one. So, but yeah, no. When I saw his horns, when he ran off, he was. If I had to guess, he might have been a basket six or eight pointer. But I would have shot him it was like last Saturday of yeah. the whole season. So Vermont buck. Yeah, exactly. Although Nick seems to find some big ones. Yeah, he up does. There. They're up there. I don't ever. We have a camp on Lake Seymour. I never spend much time up there during rifle season. I always go to Maine, which. I really need to go up there because there's some big uh, the territory is big first of all it's just like Maine but there's some big deer up there too but they're just a little harder to find that's all yeah the big ones yeah they opened it years ago they opened the it was in the 80s they opened it up to you could shoot a buck or a doe yeah and the Benoit's talked about that like the hills just ran red Oh, yeah. And they just wiped them out. Yep. And it hasn't really recovered with bad winters and the introduction of coyotes. and No, it hasn't. Um, but there's it's coming around. Yep. There's, there's good ones up there. <clears throat> they're definitely, you know, regardless of of antlers, they're going to be bigger bodied. Oh, yeah, for there. sure. They're that northern Borealis whitetail they for are. sure. Yeah, I've shot, that, I've shot one at camp there. My first buck didn't come from our camp now i didn't know her then but it came from my uncle's camp and that that had a, a good body on it it was still only 115 pounds but I had a good body on it yeah for sure you could tell it was a northern deer nothing for horns but yeah good fat chest on them and everything yeah so let's talk about uh let's go through a couple of your your bigger ones there um was that first yeah, one the first one i'll tell you first that was uh my first ever trip up there actually that was 2016 in jackman and uh i couldn't take the whole week off because of work my brother and a couple buddies went up for the whole week and i met them on tuesday night and they'd been hunting this area all for sunday mon or not sunday but monday and tuesday and they would saw some deer found some good sign and so Wednesday we drove in there and first thing driving in that ro one of the roads we cut a pretty decent buck track crossing the road and being my first time up there and first day I was gung ho I would attract anything that day so me and another buddy went after that one and we tracked it for quite a while not not all day and we didn't do anything we probably should have looking back but we never jumped it or anything but 
learned the area a little bit and the next day we went in there and I don't even remember what happened that day, but that Friday or Thursday, no Friday night. No, it would have been Thursday night. We got like six inches of heavy, wet snow and it freshened everything up. And me and my brother drove in that road and we got like eight miles out the road and our buddies were in front of us and they turned around for some reason and stopped and really asked them what they were doing. They said they're, they wanted to go check another road. We could continue on that road. So we went maybe 200 yards past where they turned around and this smoke and fresh big buck track crossed the road. He was, it was that deer actually. And he was big. It was the biggest track we'd ever seen together. And so we parked there and we hunted him all day long and finally jumped him, I think, with a doe at like a little after four that afternoon. What he did is he went all the way down eight miles. We were in on the truck. He went all the way down the road. Basically, he followed the road in the woods all the way down to the main road stepped out of the snowbank must have got on the pavement i don't know what he did he came back in and that's when we jumped him and we had to leave him then basically it was pretty well getting dark in the woods so we got got a ride back to the truck and the next morning we went back in there and he was with a doe track him and him and a doe or maybe him and two does i don't remember but he was coming back out of that area crossing the road into this other like i call it a little piece of the big woods because it was like it's an intersection of two roads with a big cut that has a little triangle piece of woods between it. It's probably like a 15 acre piece of woods. So I was wound up. It was the very last day of the season. So my brother didn't want to go with me that day. He said he'd walked too far the day before. So I was like, well, I don't care who comes with me, but I'm going. And my buddy Ben decided to go with me. And we went in there and he, we just circled for like two hours. He was just dogging those does and doing a little bit of feeding. And finally he split off from those does and bedded down. And we found his bed, and he had a walk and track leaving it, and it was 100% fresh. And he was right on the edge of that cut. So we actually, I remember we ran a little bit, which was real stupid, but it worked. We ran <laughs> a little bit towards that cut, and we got up towards the edge, and we could just see him on the very back side just walking along. So I pulled up real quick and shot, and he stood there looking around to see what happened. And it was like a 150-yard shot, so... This time I relaxed a little bit and leaned up against the tree and shot, and he dropped right there. And Ironically enough, the road was right there, too. It was only, like, that's probably a 150-yard shot to him and 200 yards to the road, and my brother and Mike were driving down the road because they hadn't Perfect. seen this buck's track leave yet, leave that piece of woods. So it was it was a group effort. We all had a part in it for sure. So it was pretty cool. We got up to him, and I hit him back between the hind legs and, the, and his rib cage, and I hit that artery there. Oh, and his spine. Yeah. yeah so he bled out real quick and died real quick and it's cool. but yeah it was pretty cool i couldn't believe it. never seen a deer like that you know that the big he was 195 pounds in the last day so who knows what he really was at the beginning of the season but well yeah add 40 percent exactly know. so 230 or something he was yeah, a, he good, was a real big deer so good that one. was cool easy drag though to the track and threw it in headed to bishops perfect but yeah, that cap that capped the trip off for sure. But yeah, and then the next couple of years, the year after that, I shot a, a four pointer up there. I sat down to eat an apple, and a doe came running by, and I figured it'd be cool. If, never really had it happen that a buck was chasing a doe, but it kind of seemed that way. And then sure enough, he came running out, and thought he was a lot bigger than he was. So I shot him, and he wasn't. But mm, whatever, it was it was cool. Made for a story. I actually just met up with my brother and Mike on a ridge and went down into the cedar bog and really liked it, actually. And then I kind of came out of it, and that's when I sat down. And they were just running the edge of that, which happens quite a lot now that I know something about it. Yep, that edge thing. Oh, yeah. They're always on it. Because they can bail yep. if they need to. And a lot of times they, they're 20 yards into it yeah. where they can look out exactly. into the open Sometimes they won't even step out. They'll just stick their nose out. Oh, yeah. Nope, I'm not going out there. Yeah. I don't see what I want to see. I, in that same bog, actually, I spent a lot of time in there the, the following year scouting. and I found two big signposts in there, and I, I tracked another deer. There was like, there had to be almost two feet of snow in 2018. I don't know. There was, there was so much that it was hard to tell what way the tracks were going. And... I tracked this deer up over the ridge and it got up top and he got into some other deer and I thought I was still on his track, which turns out I was, but I couldn't tell when we were going down the hill. 
snow was so powdery and I just couldn't tell if I was actually on his track going down the hill or if there was another deer coming up that I was following backwards. Right. So I got down into the tow road that wraps around that bog and I was looking in there. I thought I, I just saw a deer. It just walked behind some lowdowns, but it wasn't the, going the way that those tracks that I, were, that I was on were going, which doesn't matter obviously, but so I was trying to figure it out. I was grunting a little bit. I couldn't see anything. I waited a while. So I got antsy, I walked forward like 20 yards and he jumped up he must have been laying down. He must, must have, it was him. And he must have went down behind those blowdowns and laid down. He must have been feeding down there. I know he was feeding down there now, but I, I should have shot at him. I, that was back when I still had a scope on that gun. And it took me too long to find him in the scope, but he was a nice buck. He wasn't. He wasn't anything like the big one. and probably like the that seven pointer. But either way, I I tracked him all the rest of that day. It was like 13 miles and two feet of snow, and pretty much ruined my week. I was so tired after that. But yeah, it's tough. That deep snow is. Oh, it's, it, it was at least powdery, so you could get through it all right. But it was a lot of it. Yeah, and it's hard to tell. <clears throat> Timmy explained to me in that deep snow because like because they have a hawk yeah their back leg yeah. so you can tell if it lifts straight out yeah you can tell which direction they're going that way yeah. that's how he does it anyway yeah but like you said other deer use other deer's tracks just because yeah, it's exactly. easier it, it was just kind of like i was quite sure i mean obviously you can see the snow rolling down the hill too but when right. there's two feet of snow and you're walking up a hill there's shit rolling behind you too yeah so it's exactly. just it was hard to tell and i was second guessing myself and that's I probably could have shot him the first time I got when I got to that bog and I saw him. His, I just saw from like his front shoulder back, and he wasn't. He didn't know I was there. He was just walking slowly, like 50, 60 yards. But if I was more focused on the hunt and not worried about what I was actually following, right? He was probably standing right there when I came off the bank. But yeah. Hindsight. Yeah, it's always twenty twenty. And for people listening, that probably the majority of people listening to this are from the Northeast and they know, but. Um, we talk about shooting running deer and only seeing a bit of them and shooting like if you don't shoot man you yeah, you're, not you're just not going to get them no you're not and what people don't realize is there's snow on the ground so not only are they leaving blood but they're leaving tracks yeah. so you you can't you can't lose the you deer. can't lose the deer no. you can give up but we don't give up no you can't in the north main woods you can sit in a tree stand all you want Good luck seeing one. <laughs> yep. And you could go seven days and that buck finally comes around to that big scrape. Yeah. And he wins you. Exactly. And all you hear is him, him he blowing. He just ran away before he even got there. You know, when the snow flies, it's, it's kind of like it evens the playing field. It does. It gives us more of an, more of an advantage because they got all the advantages in the world. But I wish I could sit, though, speaking of sitting in the big woods. If I was able to really, I can't sit. I hate it. But I found. That's s- a common trend with trackers. Yeah, I found some <laughs> multiple areas in the big woods that I wish, if I could sit for a week straight, if we had bare ground or something, which maybe I could, but I, I really don't think I could. But I know there's some spots up there I found that somebody would really shoot a nice buck if they were patient enough to sit for a week. I feel like the only way, you'd have to like learn some like deep meditation oh, yeah, or for something sure. because you might not even see squirrels. No, I tried last... Like literally nothing. Last, uh, I don't remember if this was the first day of last year or not, but we didn't really have snow. I went back into the area that I shot a, the big one in the previous year, and I actually saw that day. So my brother and, and Mike were in another area, that same woods. I was walking through one of these old cuts in there, and, and a spike horn jumped up behind a rock, wide open, bedded down right in front of me. It wasn't wide open. It was so grown up. But So he ran off towards my brother. So I called my brother on the radio. I said, hey, you got a spike horn coming towards you. Well, I was talking to my brother on the radio, and I dropped my radio and grabbed my gun because, like, 60 or 80 yards behind him, a nice, I got to imagine, it was definitely an eight-pointer. He jumped up. He must have been with that spike horn, but farther away. He must have watched the whole thing go down with the spike horn, realized that the spike horn jumped up because of me, and he did too. And I was not, I was paying no attention because I wasn't going to shoot the spike horn. I was just trying to let my brother know. And so that deer ran off. I think that was Saturday because we got there Friday night. So Monday, we didn't still didn't have any snow. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go sit in that cut and see if anything comes by. But I'm so bad at sitting. What I'm getting at is I was there for like two hours, and then I got cold, so I started a fire. And 
sending smoke signals to my brother. It's not going to work out for me. <laughs> I, I got to move. Yep. Yeah, but if you could, if somebody could, you know, get that like Zen like patience and sit on a signpost, like yeah, yeah, you you could probably kill one for sure. But the problem is like. You know, say you want to shoot a big one, and you've been there four days, and a decent one comes by. Do you hold off, or do you, you know, it's like... Yeah. Totally. You you could pass that decent one, go the rest of the week, be driving home Sunday, like, wish I shot that yeah. small eight. Well, that's... If you only get a week, you probably ought to shoot it, because yep. your chances are pretty slim. Yeah, and especially, you know... The rut phase. Maybe if it's early season, better chances are late season. But late season, there's usually snow somewhere in Maine. So yeah, there you is. just go to that anyway. So I've been knock on wood. I've been we've been fortunate at going to, to Jackman. There's always been snow for us. Whether it's terrible snow or good snow, that's the problem. But even an inch across is better than no snow, in my opinion. Yeah, I like to be able to at least see what has been walking through there. And yep. Yeah, what some people don't know either is there's often times you're on bad tracking snow mm -hmm. rather than good but yeah, you just the, gotta sound like a deer as best you can yeah for sure the morning i shot that big one up there it was some of the worst tracking snow you could ever imagine and then it got up to about 38 degrees and started raining and it just softened stuff up just enough and got windy it was still kind of loud but it was windy enough but the snow wasn't good you know so. right and probably disappearing yeah it was gonna thank god i got one before it did but yeah i don't know i like it up there a lot definitely i'll probably always go there yeah i'd like to broaden my horizon a little bit maybe go to a different part of maine but i get so used to a place and i feel like well I'm... that that zone four is good yeah it is like you go up when i was up filming lee's moose hunt yeah granted it's coming out of summer and they're not you know laying a lot of tracks down no, but we but we covered i don't know 100 miles in that week probably upwards of yeah and all i saw was some little tiny fawn tracks that i don't think that thing made the winter yeah tiny and and some doe tracks yeah the whole week no kidding and it's like i talked to hal at, at camp and he's like yeah he's like they cut all the deer yards off up here years ago and he's like it just wiped them out he's like it used to be it used to be amazing up here yeah the deer hunting but yeah it's too bad they can't they can't do anything about that they can't regulate it because it's all technically privately owned yeah, land yeah so there's nothing they can do about it they'll cut every cedar swamp oh it, yeah you know if they can get their hands on some cedar they're gonna take it yeah they're gonna cut it and it's just a shame that there's still there's still deer up there and you have the chance the only good thing i'd say about going up there you wouldn't have to worry about getting tangled with other deer. No, no, that's it, that's a big problem with me. I, it's not really. I guess it, it's a problem, but bucks always bring you to other deer, and then you get into those other deer, you get screwed up. Yeah, that's why it's so much nicer to, to not find an average buck track when there's a bunch of average bucks in the woods. Yep, if you find that monster, it's so easy to decipher. Yep, but it's also a lot harder to find that monster track. So, yeah, you gotta gotta spend time. Yep. Now, do you? <clears throat> When you're locating, are you you covering miles, or do you do some from the vehicle? Or no, so I used to. So, like everybody else, I'm just 100 percent self-taught tracker and deer hunter. Really, I mean, learned a lot from my grandparents and my father growing up. But I used to, when we first started going to Maine, th think that it was beneficial to wake up at three in the morning and drive around the roads and drink coffee, and then by seven o'clock I want to take a nap. It's 100 percent useless in my opinion. It. Uh, I remember one morning we we went out this way the hell out this road and at like four in the morning we cut a big buck track and then it was a couple hours old at that point but we parked the truck there and waited for daylight and tracked it never jumped that deer ever it would have been no different if i'm sure it would have still been the first one in there at light right and just found him then so yeah now i just uh i try to figure out an area i want to hunt and now that i've been up there for a few years in a row now i got quite a few areas that I, I know are good so i'll go in and if they haven't cut them off anyway so i'll go in yeah. and i'll just do a big loop in there and walk a mile one way and a mile the other way and if i don't cut anything i'll 
move on. Yep. That's exactly how I shot that big one, the biggest one in there. That's That morning I went into an area that I'd hunted all week, actually, and there was some big deer in there. But for two days in a row that I was in there, I hadn't cut any really good fresh tracks, or big ones anyways. So I did a, a big loop in there that morning, never cut any fresh ones, and got back out to the truck. And I was thinking I was going to actually go back to town because I was – freaking drained it was friday i was gonna go back down and grab a bite to eat and come back out and i was like no nah, you know what it was starting to rain warm up like i said the snow was getting a little better it's like i'll just drive out the road so i got like 17 or 18 miles out the road and i thought i saw a deer down in the woods and it wasn't it was a boulder but as i was looking at that i could see this track in the road so i got out and looked at it and it was a big track but it was like i said raining getting a little warmer it was hard to tell if it was very fresh i was like well this looks like a good spot i'll just try this so i pulled over and i went like not far, 100 yards into the woods, and I cut a smoking fresh big buck track. There was two of them with a doe. So I was like, perfect. So we went like maybe a mile, and they fought and split up and went up over the ridge. And the buck tracks were identical. I don't know what one was bigger rack-wise, but he, they went up over the ridge and fed in this cut and then went straight back up on top of the ridge. So having a little bit more experience now, I was like, they got to be up there. So I slowly crept up over this this big boulder it was like the size of a vehicle on the side of this it was basically a, a, some ledges so i kind of crept up over it as track went around to the right i went around to the left because it was easier for me no, there, i didn't really do it specifically because i thought it would be a better vantage point right i just went up to the left and i i got up to the top and f- i'd love to go back and run a tape measure across it because i swear it was within 10 feet he was right there we just locked eyes at the same time and i had the oh shit look in my eyes and so <laughs> didn't he so he, he jumped up and spun around, and I, I swung on him, and I shot him right in the ass as he was running away. And I shot again as he, he was still within 20 yards when I shot the second time. I missed because I saw the bark on a spruce tree. I just about tipped over. So, But when I shot the first time, he took a hard right. He had to go right because I shot his the right side of his back leg. And I went through his right side of his ass and came out like halfway through his rib cage. And I, I didn't know where I hit him. I knew I must have hit him in the ass if I actually hit him. So I saw a little blood instantly, and I went like... Now, mind you, the whole time I'm trying to get this on video, so I wasn't, like, videoing the shots or anything, but I'd do a little interview here, a little bit, one there. And so I, I fired up my video camera again, or my phone camera again, and I'm talking, and I found a little blood, and put my phone back in my pocket, and I, he went through some jack furs that were, like, four feet tall you couldn't even see through him he just must have he just barrel rode through him is what he did i'm on my hands and knees and i can see a deer like another 15 feet in front of me over that ledge that i just came up around and it looked like he was standing there so i I stood up and then it it looked like the deer was dead but still standing there and and it was him all i can see is his rack and he's so close and i'm like this is all within like a millisecond but i'm processing my mind there's no way there's an alive deer standing there looking at me right now and then he moved his head because i thought the trees caught him that's how thick it was right there he moved his head so i just i shot him instantly and then he ran i shot him again and he went maybe 60 yards and died but that's what i thought happened is that he just ran down through there and his horns grabbed all the trees and he just was standing there but he wasn't he was pumping blood out of his ass and but yeah yeah, so that's he's a he's a good one too i'll probably use it for the thumbnail on this yeah, podcast but, definitely that's um, like so that getting back to the point of that it's, i guess my point is you can find tracks either way that way i got i didn't have any luck that day trying to find one from the woods and i wasn't specifically going to look one look at look for a track from the road i just got lucky and i believe that was his track maybe from earlier in that morning crossing the road and then he got with those other deer or vice versa i don't know how it worked out but yeah however you find them doesn't matter yeah exactly but yeah i still that day i didn't go in that piece of woods after his track like on his track thinking i was going to freshen it up because even when it got out of the road it was so looking back it probably wasn't that old because it was getting pretty warm melted out yeah they they melt out quick yeah they do but i just happened to stumble on his fresh track pretty quick and yeah that was cool i'll never forget that one yeah he what 210 210 yeah i was all by myself and uh I was quite a ways back, so I had to make a decision, and it was like 1.30 when I shot him. I, was, I figured I was probably a mile straight line, maybe a little less, and 
I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I got it in real quick. I did a little video interview and I figured I would drag until dark and then go get help if I needed it because my brother and Mike were up there too. Because my stepdad shot one earlier in the week, like a 186 pound six pointer or something like that. It was a nice little buck. And so he went home. So I was like, I really was con. I was hoping Tyler and Mike maybe would be driving around at some point and find my truck. So I kept calling him on the radio, nothing. So I was like, I guess I'll just drag until dark and then I'll go find him go get help so I dragged until like four o'clock I got to the truck luckily and then I had to figure out how to get him in the truck by myself so yep. I did anyways we flopped in the truck and I just about laid down next to the deer I was so exhausted and this truck comes around the corner I was like, you gotta be kidding me should have just waited 15 seconds and I would have got some help but yeah so adrenaline then I, helps yeah then I got out the road and I called my brother because the first bit of service you get when you're driving out that particular road I, I got a chance I called him I called her and, and I called my brother. I was, he didn't believe me. I'm like, no, really. I shot a nice eight pointer. He'd been sitting in the camp since noon. Him and my buddy Mike taking a nap, I think, or something. Oh. I don't know. I was so pissed. I, was like, I wish I'd known that. I'd just driven back, got some help. But what are you gonna do? It was an experience. It was pretty cool to be able to do it all on your own. And I didn't. I figured he was 200 pounds, but it was kind of hard to tell. He was a long, skinny deer. It wasn't really skinny. He was just really long. And what time of year was that? Was that that Thanksgiving week? No, it was the week before. I think it was like November 22nd, Friday, something like that. Yeah, still they've been running some weight off. Yeah, he'd been then. running maybe 220, 230. I don't know. He was a big deer, though. But he, he probably, have you put a tape on him? I bet he goes 140. 134 and 6.8. 134, yeah. Yeah. He doesn't have shit for brow tines, so. Yeah, main. Well, yeah, exactly. But yeah, he's a, he's a good one. I think he was 20 inches wide, something like that. I have to run a tape on him again, but yeah, he was big. No ground shrinkage there. No, no enlargement. Actually, I yep. didn't realize he was that big. I started walking up to him. I got a, a, that on video too, and he was had his head kind of tips upside down. He was still moving a little bit, and I couldn't believe it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It was kind of, like I said, being alone. It was a surreal moment. The other one. We were all there, kind of. Right. It, almost instantly, because as soon as I shot, they knew I get. We called them on the radio, and they were right there, anyways, just about. So we all made it to the deer just about the same time. This time it was just me. It was pretty. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, hopefully that's the first of many. Yeah, hopefully. I've had a lot of, and I've gone to Maine five years. This will be my sixth season, and I've. Last year I didn't actually shoot, but. Like I said, I saw it spike horn and that other, the bigger one. And then later in that week, I tracked a giant, the biggest track I've ever followed. And I caught up to him. And actually, I can't say I caught up to him. I know I did, but I never saw him. I saw the doe he was with. And his tracks were right there too, leaving. I just didn't see his horns. Didn't see his body. But I've had good luck. I've missed two good ones up there. I've got three. So, Yeah. Learn every time. Yeah, exactly. It's definitely not a, as any form of deer hunting, it's not cut and dry. It's not a one size fits all no. approach. No, it's, it's not. Every situation's different. Yep. Um, and that snow just kind of gives us a little bit more of an advantage. Oh, yeah. A little bit. It does. We know where they're going. That's about all we got yep. for an advantage. <laughs> exactly. They're still, um, yeah, they're good at surviving. They've been doing it for millions of years. Yeah, they're not dumb. It's hard. It's hard to kill them. Yeah, it really. Is. Especially when they get older, they start getting those two hundred pound bodies, and yeah, they've learned a thing or two. Oh yeah. But that's instilled in them from when they're fawns. You know, those escape tactics. Yep. That's what mom teaches them. And, that's right. Um, and I've had them pull the tricks on me, like you hear about, like walking up brooks for fifty yards, and yep. that's happened to me. I've seen it. And, walking through skitter ruts yep they do it and they'll, they'll lose you too they, they won't necessarily lose you if you spend your time you can find them but the one i'm talking about i walked up the brook for like 50 60 yards i lost him for a good it took me 20 minutes to figure out where he went because who knows yep. what way up the brook he went and right you got to find out where he jumped out and you know a big buck will take a good 20 foot bound sometimes so yeah consciously yeah They'll try to get that scent as far away from exactly. the water as they can. That's right. They don't know that we can look down and see the track. That's not yeah, what they're thinking. Exactly. But 
but when they jump 20 feet out of a brook into some jack first that you really yep all you got going for you is the snow that's falling off the trees yep yeah it's tricky yeah that one i screwed up on in new hampshire after he um stopped in the middle of the open hardwoods uh he ran off from there and he came to a brook it wasn't super wide but he stopped running walked through the brook i don't know if he like swished his feet off yeah and then on the other side he walking tracks again again. oh no kidding yep he's like well got rid of that whatever that was (laughs) you know that was his escape tactic yeah and it's worked for him before that's right for many years i think because he was a good one i got a camera up there now that i put i put in there in like february yeah i gotta go check it i want to see if it's on those oaks yeah so if they if they're producing which good chance this year is a lot of oaks but i want to see if he's still around yeah that was the last last day of rifle and there was like half a week left of of bow only and i highly doubt anybody yeah. was in there yeah i doubt it too so if he Get survived the winter it's big woods too yeah but i think they leave that area and they go over to where they uh clear cut and i think they spend the winters over there because um when i went to put the cam camera in there in february they had gotten a lot more snow up there than we had in town yeah. and it was like yeah waist deep yeah i'm like i'm still gonna put it here but yeah. <laughs> I, there's no deer tracks around no no I went somewhere else yep i think they head over to those cuts and so they have food but yeah, I don't. I think so. The earlier when I was talking about that big ten pointer in New Hampshire, I think that deer's like. I, I think he just comes during the rut, but that's why it's kind of weird to me that I think I found his shed from the the previous two years. Because he's not, he's definitely not there right now. He wasn't there last winter either, so he either got killed or he lives somewhere way off and. Yeah, you're at the very the outside of his loop, probably. Exactly. You're at the outside of his territory. Yeah. Who knows? It's hard to pattern those deer, but... Yeah, I gave up on that. Yeah, me too. Not gave up, but... I mean, what do you... Yeah, what do you Go spend really $3,000 on trail cameras I know. And, and cover the woods in them? I yeah. mean, you can't pattern You have to cover the woods in them, too, because, like, it, what, game cameras to me are discouraging, because... Like we were just talking about earlier, a buck comes to your camera once and sees it. Now he still comes by it, but he might, he's smart. He's just going to walk 15 feet behind it, but he's still there. But because he's not on a camera, you don't think he's there anymore. So you get discouraged. You don't hunt there much anymore. Yeah. I, I, I'm only talking from experience because it happens to me every time and I I get 100% discouraged and I like to. If I go in and check my camera and I'm going to hunt that spot that night and there's big deer there, I'm all wound up. But if I go there and check my camera before I sit in my tree stand and there's nothing for the last week, it's yeah. kind of depressing. But Yeah, it's just that mind state. you got to, well, it could happen tonight. Exactly. I mean, that's, you exactly. got to keep that, like, positivity. Yep. Yeah. Because, like, I, I, it's happened to me and I'll just get down, you know, and check the camera two weeks later and, oh. Yeah, they came tonight. <laughs> they went right by. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I had that, we were talking off off air about that that big one in New Hampshire that um, I put some clips at the end of that, one of my YouTube videos, the one where I put the spy point out um, yeah. of him, but you can tell he's just a big body deer, and it was July 4th, and he's just big mass on his antlers and everything, and yeah. um, he came right up to that camera. And he didn't act real spooked, but I had it on, I think, 10 or 15 second video clips. And you can see him coming in. It was the same day I was in there. I was in there that morning. And uh, you can see him coming in. He gets right up to the camera, kind of looks at it. And then he walks away. But he, wa- he when he's walking away, he's not, he's like big stepping, you know? Yeah. Like, I think he, he might have caught, like, maybe my shirt brushed a branch and he smelled it or something he hadn't been back since yeah and i bet he's around still but he's not coming near that no he's that not immediate gonna, area yeah, so no. my cameras are telling me he's not there but i'm willing to bet he is yeah he's there i mean they're not just middle going. of july you're if you got him on daylight in the middle of july you're where he sleeps exactly like he's not 100 percent. yeah so i'm 
I got a cell camera in there on that community scrape and I'm just going to hold out and, um, Timmy's telling me to go in there and hunt him, but, uh, I'm, oh, I'm going to so hold out until he's like showing up on yeah. daylight, yeah. you know, like late October. Then I'll be torn between there and mass. Cause those cameras or that camera down in, on that community scrape has been there and I have, I'm not going in to check it until I go in to hunt. Right. And I got some big deer located there too. So it's kind of like, yeah, you know, they're going to, ah, yeah, I want to go down in, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. The end of October. That's a good time. Yeah. Real good time for that. Community and it's scrapes. not, it's not necessarily like, you know, they, they're just going to be on those scrapes. Yeah. You know, yeah. more often because there's their testosterone levels are getting bigger and oh yeah um when i set that the camera i sprayed some of uh chad whitcomb's um backyard scents yeah uh doe and buck looking branch i i bought the scrape too but i think he gets he gets it all from glands mm-hmm. um like all the uh interdict or no um pre-orbital yeah the forehead gland and the whatever i don't know if he's got some tongue juice in there or something but something but if he gets the the scrape from the tarsal gland that's still urine you know i'm I'm worried about even though it's local deer from massachusetts not deer that were raised on a big farm but i just worry about the urine and spreading disease so oh yeah i don't think i'm gonna i'm gonna use it but the licking branch works i tried it mass on a on another community scrape yeah within four hours really they were in there Bucks and does just yeah, it's good stuff. I've had a lot of luck just finding a good spot for a scrape for making a mock scrape. Anyways, just kicking the dirt out, and the dirt smell is enough to attract the right. deer, and then they, they see that it's a scrape, and then more times than not, they they make it their own, start using it. Yep. Yeah, I've tried a few. I haven't had luck yet, but probably something I did wrong. They smelled me. Yeah, that's. I did it next you to leave scent no matter what you do. So right. I try to, um, I don't use my boot. I use a stick and I try to carry the stick out with me, but yep. sometimes I forget it. Yeah. <laughs> Leave it leaned up against the licking branch. <laughs> yeah. Leave it in use the Use it as a licking branch. Yeah. May never show up again. No, it's weird. But yeah, there's no, there's so many different ways to do it. It's just personal preference. Yeah. Whatever works for you. You know, you listen to, we both listen to a lot of podcasts and you can't even find the answers. No, you can't. You just, and that's what I, I looked for for years. This is only my 11th season yep. hunting, but um, I always try to find the answers. Yep. What's the answer? Well, there isn't one. No, there isn't one. You just got to do what's yeah, you know, I haven't, I've been going to stack for... the deck in your favor. Yeah, you do. And the hope, hope it works. Learn from your mistakes, mm-hmm. try to, and. Try not to repeat them, even though I do every year. I do, too. And I, I consciously repeat my mistakes, too. Yeah, like I like shouldn't I, do this. I know I'm doing it wrong, and I'm still going to do it. Yep. Like, I'll, like, a big problem I have is I'll come out of work stinking and really be rushing to get to the woods, and I'll just change real quick and head to the woods, knowing damn well I should not go in there smelling like an oil burner or something, but I'm going to do it because right. I'm crunched for time, and I really want to be in the woods because that's all it really boils down to is I just want to be in the woods. So problem is that you ruin your spot for the year yep and i used i used to do that not i mean kind of knowing but i used to do that every day like i come out of work back when i worked at coda's a while ago and i just get out at a reasonable time i'd shower many days if i had time but i just run right to the woods yep why am i not seeing just got done cleaning the furnace yeah exactly why am i not seeing any deer and then it clicked yeah because you smell like a chimney but (laughs) Which would be good if it was the other side of the chimney. Yeah, yeah. And it was exactly. November because they're used to that smell. Exactly. But. but what are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah, well, I haven't been hunting. I mean, I've been hunting for a while. I've started hunting when I was, started, got my hunter safety and started carrying a gun when I was nine. But I really didn't take deer hunting extremely serious. I mean, I grew up from, my dad hunted, he only ever shot one deer in his life. He shot a spike horn and my grandparents hunted it religiously but only during rifle season and we'd sit in the in their dining room until seven o'clock and parents and or my dad and my grandparents would drink coffee and we'd sit around and 
shoot the shit, and then we go out and hunt until 11 and come in and eat dinner and, or eat lunch and then yep. hunt until dark. And that was only during rifle season. And, but it was religious every year. It was – we learned a lot doing it. And then – Yep. We shot, I shot quite a few doe, and I never shot a buck until I was 17, like I said earlier. But that was the first year. So since I've been 17, that's really – since – so the last eight years, I guess, that's when I really took it seriously. Tried to kill some deer. But. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, so far. Need some more time now that I'm getting older, but. Yeah, or just using your time Wiser. wiser like yeah. you said, like, instead of rushing out every night, just. Yeah, exactly. You know, wait, maybe wait for the weekend and. Yep. Where you can go in at a reasonable hour. And I, I I'm guilty of the same thing, just every day hunt every every day after work every day and then i'm almost burnt out by it you know yeah well you do get burnt out i mean it starts september 15th and we try to hunt till december 15th it's a long time yep and sitting in the food which is not something i'm going to do this year unless i'm walking through somewhere and it's just torn up and yeah you know i'm on doe patrol i might might scurry up a tree and yeah but i'm going to try to hunt those community scrapes and transition areas more yep and pick my pick my times if it's hot out and it's going to stay hot until dark you know those se- early september hunts i'm just i'm just not going to go yeah no i'm just it sucks i'm probably going to s- scout other areas and yep. see if there's scrapes popping up and you know check other community scrapes and I'll, I'll wear my saddle and stuff you know just in case yeah but uh i think i'm going to do that and that's going to keep me more mentally strong rather than just Sitting till dark and seeing nothing. Sitting till dark and seeing nothing. I'm I'm moving around. I'm scouting and yeah. you know just keeping tabs on things, which is risky too. You know it is. Yeah. But you kind of got to alter. I got enough spots where I can cycle them through where yeah. I won't visit. I'll visit one and then a week later I might be back. Yeah. Might be back. So that's my game plan this year. Do everything opposite of what I did last year. Yeah. But. Hopefully get yeah, hopefully get a would. chance to get on a track myself, but um, for sure gonna be um, filming Timmy. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. You getting into that? It's yeah, that's learning from the best, really. That was uh, the first year we didn't get a chance to do it last year because because the idiot filled all his tags before I had vacation. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the year before he shot that freak looking um yeah i think it was a giant elk i guess it was it was an elk yeah that was and even the doe that was with him i mean that thing was 180 pounds yeah i'm like why doesn't that buck have antlers (laughs) yeah it's weird we'll have to get together maybe film a hunt or something yeah for sure i got a camera arm for my tree stand i haven't got it yet i guess i ordered it too late and they're backed up yeah from the guys from out on a limb yep uh, it's nice and lightweight, but I got to experiment with that. I got a buddy here in town. But with the saddles, we could, they're easy. As long as I'm above you, Yeah. I go up yeah, the tree yeah. first. Right. Um, yeah, we could film some bow hunts or something. Yeah, it'd be cool. Yeah, I know you're busy during rifle season. Yeah, and I'm not going to have any vacation this year. It's going to, my boss is going to have to kind of. Rodney? Look, <laughs> no, Rodney ain't my boss. Rodney's not? Oh, Marcus. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, he's going to have to let me, hopefully let me go take off on a Wednesday or something. Yeah. That's how it's going to have to work because um, if you're not with Timmy, he's, he's going. Yeah, well, he has to. He waits all year for it. But We're always busy. We could probably hire you if Merrick's listening to this. Yeah. Yeah. Now, see, that industry is uh, not busy at the right time of year. Oh, it's terrible. That's why, so that's why I wasn't able to go for the whole week uh, the first year I went to Maine. Cause the at, heating industry is... At Kodos, you can't take a whole week off during November. Yep. From October to uh, April, you can't take a week straight off. So I want an industry that's busy in the summer. and Me too. I need to, like, pave or something. Yeah, there you go. Seal coat. Yeah. <laughs> but get, no, get laid off. and Where I work now, we work it out pretty good. We all hunt, so there's only five right. of us. So get a week run with it the problem is is you take your week if you can't if you don't have a job like where you can pick and choose the days you want to take because there's only a handful we all know of good days to hunt right but if you get a week like i get 
you got to make that week work. Yep. Whether it's bad snow, good snow. So that's why I, I feel I've been very fortunate to accomplish what I have so far because they haven't really been – the first week I ever went was the best week we've ever had. Since then, it hasn't been too great. But right. Yeah, you never know. It's that global warming. It is, supposedly. It's all Trump's fault. I thought the same. I went for two weeks one year. That was 2018. I got real lucky that year with time off. Oh, my God. You couldn't even get out half the roads by the end of the first week. I had to hunt closer to town. Yeah, it was crazy. There was so much snow. But hunting closer to town, all those deer were, I won't mention the name of the road. I'll never go back to hunt it because it was like a war out there. But Portage Brook? Yeah, we'll go with Portage Brook and Rangeley. <laughs> so it was, we saw like, I saw like, I might be lying here because I don't remember the exact number, over 30 or 40 deer that in that two-week time frame in Jackman. It was insane. But they were all, and she came up for like the second week or something, like Thanksgiving, she came up. And she saw a handful of deer too. And they're just does and fawns. And I missed a good one. That was, I might have missed two that year. I don't remember. I think it was when I missed the two of them. But yeah, they were just all coming to town and they were just working their way. On one of the roads we hunted, you couldn't find a deer track. That's where I primarily like, like to hunt. That's where I hunted that one down in that cedar swamp. And you couldn't find a deer track out there. And any deer track you did was headed south, it was headed to town. There's too much snow. Yep. But, yeah, they were migrating. Yep, just early. And then and then you run into like ethics. For that, pe- for people that aren't familiar with it, you know, the northern Maine, northern New Hampshire, the parts of northern Vermont, our deer migrate. They yeah. have to get out of they have to get in the low country and yep. people feed them in towns and stuff because the, they go and they cut all the deer yards off and they'll never survive the winter. There's still a few left, but there's people that cuz it's not illegal they sit oh, on those yeah. migration trails it's and they just ethical, pick them off. That's for sure. They just pick them off. And it's, you know, we shoot at running deer and all that, and you claim that's unethical, but you ask anybody that tracks and that, not anybody, but people with a, a brain in their head, well, like those you poor said, deer really. are like literally in survival mode. They have to use those migration trails. That's and right. You're just going to sit there in your pickup truck and shoot them? Well, so they do. Like that Come deer on. I'm talking about in that particular road, those people are driving out that road. And you can ask her, you'd be driving out the road and see this orange blob sitting on a milk crate on the side of the road, on the road, or a stump on the, in the ditch. Right. And they're just waiting for a deer to walk across the road headed towards, towards town. And, yeah, I don't know. You can get a long ways out that road, so that's what that's what we did. We went way the hell out there, tried to get away from people, and you were still just, the deer, were, it's like flocks of turkeys, they are just coming. Yep. But we didn't see any horns. So. But that was... I was just as tired as the deer were. I think that was two weeks of dragging my feet around in twenty some odd inches of snow. So, yep, that'll do it. It will. But, but all right, well, let's wrap this one up. We got yeah, it's been good talking. Almost an hour twenty. Holy smokes! Yeah, it goes by. It does go by. But uh, yeah, looking forward to getting into deer season here. And me too. It's coming quick. Um, when this one comes out, we'll hopefully have a couple of deer down. I but, hope so. Yeah. But uh, yeah, good talking to you, Tucker. You too, Jason. I appreciate it. Take care. You too. Hey, thanks for tuning in to this week's episode. Make sure and come back and join us every other Monday with a brand new episode. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, make sure and leave a review. And you can find me on YouTube at Northeast Hunt and Film. Once again, thanks for listening.